Yo, what's up guys? I'm Nuo, and today I'm going to show you how to complete the reprised version of King's Fall in Destiny 2 with only three people. Before we begin, if you are interested in 3-manning other raids, check out the guides on the screen now. Their links will be in the description below. King's Fall released last Friday, and to everyone's surprise, the entire raid can actually be completed with 3 people. Flawlessly even. All encounter timestamps will be in the description below. But first, I'll go over class composition. Any class composition can get this done but I recommend at least two Warlocks. Having two Wells makes a lot of the encounters just a little bit easier. In my opinion, two Warlocks and one Titan is ideal, but the strategy is very flexible. The entrance to King's Fall has a few neat tricks that make it quick and painless. Your two Relic Runners will either be Icarus Dash Warlocks or someone on an Arc subclass with high mobility and the Amplified buff. Using the pathing shown in the background, you can avoid all barriers. Your third person will just need to clear adds and you'll be good to go. On the left side, the person should hop down onto this little platform here and then melee Icarus Dash or if they're on an Arc subclass with Amplified, simply just jump across. Then they can hop up and dunk the Relic. On the right side, you'll need to use these invisible platforms. It might take a few tries to figure out where they are, but these platforms always spawn in the same spot, so you can use them to hop across. Simply repeat this as many times as you need until all six relics are dunked. If you mess up a relic, in Destiny 2 it doesn't actually go backwards one, so there's no penalty to messing up, aside from any time you lose. Unfortunately, in order to complete the jumping puzzle with three people, you will need to have a few people leave the instance. The easiest way to complete this is to have the people who stand on the plate to disable the barrier leave when the third person gets through. They can rejoin when the third person goes up the elevator and they will spawn in the new load zone ready for the next encounter. Totems is by far the hardest encounter for this low man, but really only for one player. This one player has to skate between the middle and left totem over and over again with very little room for error for nearly 7 minutes. And it gets harder as you go. The basic flow of this encounter is this solo player prevents the Annihilator totem from wiping you by skating back and forth to the left totem and back to middle, but they don't ever have any sort of buffs. Meanwhile, the other two players get stacks of Deathsinger's power and trade off who is on the plate. The solo player should ideally be a Warlock with Icarus Dash, though I've seen Astro Sight Blink working as well. As I mentioned before, your task is to sustain the left side without ever grabbing any buffs. The tricky part is, you can't stand on the totem for more than 15 or so seconds without dying to the ticking poison, which will ramp up and damage the longer you are in the totem room. In order to avoid dying, you will need to leave the room for a short duration. You must stay outside the room for enough time for the game to reset your so-called stacks of poison so that when you re-enter the room, you don't die in one or two ticks. This isn't a buff that will be on your screen, but it is tracked in the background. If you are too slow getting back to the Annihilator Totem after waiting outside, you will wipe your team. There are a few audio visual cues to get this timing down. Your cue to enter the room is when the debuff, Annihilator Totem, appears in the bottom left of your screen. Immediately after seeing this debuff, swords get into the room and land on the totem when you see this. You must stand on the totem long enough for it to fully reset. 
when the totem resets, there will be an audible clank. This is your sign to jump up in Swords Gate Out. Again, you will wait outside until you see the debuff, which basically coincides with your poison stacks being reset. While waiting outside, take this opportunity to clear all adds and knights in your way so you don't eager track into them. The later in the encounter you go, the more red bar and eventually orange bar knights will spawn, so it's going to get harder. When all adds are dead, inch your way towards the poison without actually entering the room, and when the debuff appears on your screen, sword back to the totem. One of the most important pieces of this is standing as close to the poison room as possible before eagering. This will make the timing much more forgiving, and figuring this out made my totem runs far more consistent. You will repeat this process until the encounter completes. For your loadout, I recommend Heritage, Sunshot, Enhanced Healing Grenades, using the Touch of Flame aspect, Icarus Dash, and the Fragment, Ember of Empyrean. This will allow you to survive easily with near permanent restoration times too. Of course, you will also need an Eager Edge Sword. Heritage is quite useful for killing the Minotaurs and Knights, and Sunshot is great for ad clear. The team of two has a slightly easier job, but you need to make sure you're on top of your game. I recommend Heritage, Trinity Ghoul, and Devour with an Eager Edge Sword, of course. You could also use Solar with Ember of Empyrean, similar to the solo side. I recommend both players run either Magnetic or Fusion Grenades, as both of these grenades can stick the wizards you need to kill, and kill them while you're depositing stacks on the plate. You will also need something to kill the three unstoppable ogres throughout the fight. The flow of the fight is quite simple for these two people. Person 1 will grab the brand to start the encounter, and run to the totem, while Person 2 kills the wizard and knight, and grabs the brand Kramer relic. Meanwhile, Person 1 will be clearing adds and defending the totem. Once Person 2 has picked up the Brand Claimer, they should head down to the side Person 1 is at, and Person 1 will sword skate towards Person 2 when their Brand Timer is nearing 5 seconds, so that Person 2 may steal the Brand from Person 1. Ideally, this exchange happens about 2 thirds of the way from the Totem to the spot where the Brand spawns. However, this location is not extremely important, it just makes it a little bit easier for everyone. Once their brand has been stolen, player 1 should deposit their stacks while killing the wizard in the top right. Sticky grenades are an easy way to do this, as you can just throw them at the wizard and forget about it. Once all stacks are deposited, this person will kill the taken knight and grab the brain clamor, similarly to what the other person did. Just like before, when player 2's timer is running out, you will steal their brand in the same spot they stole yours. Then, you will simply repeat the process until the encounter completes. Now that's the general flow for the duo side, but there are a few more tips still. First, you should always leave the Hive Thrall alive when depositing in the middle. These Thrall will run into the right side room and are an easy source of stacks to deposit. Secondly, I recommend not getting more than 20 stacks, but if you do, the more stacks you get, the closer to middle the exchange should take place so you have plenty of time to deposit and kill your taken knight. Third, unstoppable ogres spawn every 50 stacks deposited. Make sure to wait until they have climbed out of the, the ground completely before stunning them. I like to use my Nova Bomb versus these guys as it can just clear them instantly and forget about them. Fourth, if you kill the wizard and the knight on the left side and leave the brand claimer relic on the ground, they will never respawn and will never shoot at you. Fifth, use the symbols in the back to track your progress. One stack deposited shows as one row, 21 stacks deposited shows as 2 rows, etc. All the way up to 181 stacks deposited and up, showing as 10 rows. You need to deposit a total of 200 stacks. Sixth, on your last deposit, make sure the Annihilator Totem debuff isn't on your screen. If it is and the encounter ends, the solar player cannot reset it, and you will die after the encounter ends and then be stuck in a permanent death loop. The first boss in the raid is very much a bullet sponge. This encounter is not terribly difficult, but a major emphasis in the encounter is heavy ammo management. However, like all my guides, I can't guarantee the meta will not change, in fact, it likely will, 
So if you are watching this guide in 3 months or even a year later, you might want to watch a more recent clear to make sure you are using optimal loadouts. Aside from that, I hope the rest of the guide can help stand the test of time. To start, I recommend at least two Warlocks on Well of Radiance. There are ways to get this encounter done with only one Well, but the two Well strategy is just simpler. These Warlocks will be responsible for left side and right side, and they will be responsible for generating heavy ammo with Aeon finishers. The third member will be on stasis and will clear adds in the middle and be responsible for the middle plate. The two well users can make sure they have the mod Supreme Wellmaker equipped. Optionally, they can also use Seeking Wells as it helps out a little bit. This season, Sunder and Glare is a must for the debuff. The Warlock should also be able to quick swap armor from Aeons to Lunas right before the damage phase. I recommend these Warlocks use a shotgun or herbalist paired with a heavy linear fusion rifle. Preferably one with triple tap or fourth times the charm and focus fury. If you do not have a focus fury linear fusion rifle, Vorpal or firing line works as well, but they are not as good here. Cataclysmic with bait and switch also works great. For the third person, they will use Arbalist, a primary of choice in a stasis linear fusion. Currently, Reed's Regret is the only linear fusion that fits this category. Ideally, a triple tap focus fury roll is the play, but firing line and Vorpal also work. If you have to choose between linear fusions, know that triple tap is more important and you should not be using something like climb cartridge. For mods, this person will also use 4 copies of Font of Might paired with the Stasis Elemental Time Dilation. This will give them 30 seconds of Font of Might when the well user casts their well. If you have Sundering Glare, use that as well. If for whatever reason your team cannot reproduce this setup because maybe you haven't gotten the mods from Ada or you just didn't play at the time, your team can always forego the stasis font of might stuff, but your damage might be a little bit lower. The flow of this encounter is pretty simple. Have your well warlock hit Aeon finishers on all yellow bars on either side. In earlier rounds these will be wizards, in later rounds they will be knights. Clear adds on all the sides. When the sequence starts, hop on your plates and start damage. Damage will always occur in the back middle of the room. This is super important. One warlock should pop their well in the back, Depending on who has the brand, one of the well warlocks needs to go kill the first knight. So, for example, if the warlock on the left has the brand, the warlock on the right needs to kill the first knight. If the warlock on the right has the brand, the warlock on the left needs to kill the first knight. And if your stasis person has the brand, you can choose. The stasis person will never kill any knights. They are going to be putting out massive DPS, so you want them there as long as possible. Once the first knight is killed and the timer has been reset, the other person will kill the second knight and reset the timer once more. DPS until your timer is out and then hide behind the middle pillar. Using the middle pillar first will make DPS in later phases much easier because the war priest will not duck behind the pillar. However, near the end of the damage phase, the well will most likely run out, so it's important you place a rift and proc radiant for that damage buff and healing. When the Oculus is finished flashing, have the Warlock switch sides and repeat their Aeon finishing process while collecting the other person's heavy ammo. So if you're on left, for the second phase you'll be on right, if you're on right for the second phase you'll be on left. The Stasis person should have used most of their ammo, so they will also need to run around and grab the finishers. Again, the Well Lock should be hitting Aeon finishers and clearing adds until the sequence starts. When the sequence is finished and damage begins, the Warlock who didn't place their Well in Phase 1 should now have it and can place it here. This is why I recommend two wells, because without generating orbs, it's very unlikely that your warlock will get well back between damage phases. Just repeat damage as you did in the first phase, however, with a few seconds remaining on the final countdown, you're going to need to run to either the left or the right pillar to dodge the oculus. Repeat this process through the fourth phase, where you must kill warpriest before the oculus wipes you, because there are no more pillars to hide behind. Here's a quick example damage phase from a well lock point of view. Right. Oh. Left. So, Jeff, you're killing first night. Yep. Stop moving. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Do I need to well? Nope. Yeah. I'm just gonna Wait, rift when it runs no. out. I'm gonna radiant. Supreme Wallmaker. You didn't get font? 
two, no. one. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. sure you don't that, have that. I have time dilation, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, our yeah. damage is fine, though. Uh, I'll put on Seeking Wells. I, I do have Supreme Wellmaker on. Yeah, I believe you. I don't I don't even see them on the ground All anywhere. Right, out. Go to middle. Golgoroth is definitely one of the more chaotic encounters for this low man. It's really hard to give an exact strategy, but I'll try to give you some tips. If you're continuing to use the at least two warlocks I recommended at the beginning of the video, you'll have a few options here. If you're using a slightly different class composition, you might have to improvise a little bit. But what has been working for my team is to have one designated DPS person and two gaze holders. This simplifies the fight for DPS because the person who's DPSing only has to focus on one thing and not everyone needs to worry about the gaze. The gaze holders really shouldn't need to put out massive damage with this strategy and they can really focus their loadouts on making sure the pools are dropped efficiently and they can get the gaze by sniping it or shooting it with a linear uh, without problem. Alternatively, you could also use a three person rotation for the gaze, but in my opinion, this is less optimal because everyone's loadout just needs to be a little bit good at everything, but no one can specialize in their task. So you might have some mess ups. Because of this, I'm only going to explain the loadouts I would recommend if you choose to do the two person rotation. First things first, you're going to need to assign one person to be the person who never grabs gaze. This will be the person who puts out massive damage. This person should ideally be a Titan or a Warlock. If they are a Warlock, they can use a Linear Fusion, ideally Cataclysmic, so that they can use Font of Might, and then Wither Horde and Starfire nades for when they run out of ammo. I recommend running Explosive Wellmaker or Elemental Ordnance along with Seeking Wells, Well of Life, and Font of Might. If this person is a Titan, they can use the Warm Gods 1-2 Punch Shield Bash build to do crazy damage. I haven't done this myself, but background footage shows a clip from Zemo doing this strategy and actually soloing the DPS and killing Gorgoroth in one phase. Zemo's full video will be in the description. Obviously, you don't need to kill him in one phase, but as long as you can get 3, 4, or even 5 Shield Bashes in in a phase, you'll be golden. The Gaze Holder should have both a primary capable of shooting down pools and another weapon capable of taking the gaze efficiently. I recommend one gaze holder to run tractor cannon for the debuff, as well as a sniper for the gaze and a primary to shoot down the pools. The other person can run an LMG or linear fusion paired with Arbalist and a primary of choice. Regardless of which strategy you choose, you will likely only have three damage phases to get the kill. That's why it's important to chunk Golgoroth down with the Curse Thrall explosion that deals over 500,000. This fight can get quite chaotic, but the gist of it is, clear adds until you can begin damage and have your two gaze holders rotate the gaze while your designated DPS person pumps out massive damage. Make sure to utilize healing, rifts, and wells to stay alive while also ensuring the adds do not get out of hand. Daughters is probably the easiest encounter of the low man. To be quite honest, the strategy doesn't really differ much from the six man. You'll just want to go fast enough that you have enough time for damage. You'll want one Divinity, one Gallarhorn, and one Legendary Rocket like a Hothead. Warlock should use well, and everyone should use Add Clear Guns. Make sure to have something with enough range to take care of the snipers as well. The strategy is simple. Start the encounter, and when one person gets torn, hop on the plate and call out the other plate. Build the platforms while clearing adds, and repeat this three times until you can slam. Slam the aura on either sister, drop a well, and bake with both pack rounds. They should chunk pretty heavily since the bosses are coded as majors. Repeat until both sisters are dead. Bro, oh <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm gonna save some galley. Oryx is a long one, but not terribly difficult. It will require good communication, planning, and execution. Much like Warpriest, you will use Linear Fusions and Font of Might for damage. I personally think everyone running Solar Cataclysmic is the easiest way to do this encounter, but another viable option is Stasis in Reeds. However, I will stick with the Solar version for this guide. On the screen now are the loadouts I personally recommend. 
One or two people should have melee wellmaker or elemental ordnance to make an elemental well if needed. Everyone should also run 3 to 4 font of mites with elemental time dilation. This will give you 20 to 30 seconds of font, which is plenty for a 4 bomb damage phase. Warlock should be on well, with hunters on either Nighthawk or Star Eaters. Any Titans can also easily make a well with their hammer, so they should stick on that. To pair with your Cataclysmic, I recommend everyone run an exotic primary like Sunshot, along with a sniper like Succession, or a fusion rifle like Riptide, but you could also use Arbalist like I am in the background here, your ammo drops just might be a little bit lower. Along those lines, everyone should make sure they equip Linear Fusion Rifle Ammo Finder, because as I said, you're sort of at the mercy of RNG. This strategy for Oryx might take a few tries to get down. You will first assign one person to be the Night Killer, one person to be the Ogre Killer, and then the last person will be a Floater. When the fight starts, just clear odds until Oryx slams a plate. If you don't kill all the Ogres and Knights before starting the next mechanic, you're likely to get overrun by an ogre or miss a knight. That's why I suggest spawn killing all the ogres and all the knights. To do this, the strategy requires you to be fast, but it's extremely simple to do. If you have a well to spare, place a well in the center for your ogre killer just a few seconds after Oryx slams his plate. This well is not necessary, you can also just use Radiant if you don't have a spare well. The first ogre will always spawn one plate counterclockwise from where Oryx first slammed. So, you have your ogre person kill this ogre. Once that ogre is dead, quickly move on to the next three ogres and spawn kill them all, rotating counterclockwise around the arena. Immediately after the fourth ogre, which should be right underneath Oryx, is dead, the ogre killer should hop on the original plate Oryx slammed. When they hop on this plate, they can call out where the next plate is. Meanwhile, they can be killing the final knight. The final knight should spawn just diagonally across from where that fourth ogre was. Meanwhile, the knight killer has killed the other three knights and should be waiting in the middle with the floater when the ogre killer hops on the plate. When the ogre killer hops on the plate, either the floater or the knight killer will be torn. The other one should go to the plate the ogre killer calls out while the torn person waits in middle. When the platforms appear, they can use their platforms where their daughters used to stand to take a shortcut climb. Once the first orb has been grabbed, repeat the orb grabbing two more times, except this time it will be random who has to do what role. If you are too slow, Oryx will begin his wipe animation and slam the plate before the third orb is taken. This is probably a wipe. If you are extremely fast, you can steal the brand from the knight and head to a bomb. If you are at average speed, you probably won't be able to steal the brand before the bombs, but you can steal it afterwards. Remember, you don't need to kill the knight holding the brand. There seems to be some confusion here. You just need to steal it. Finally, when Oryx calls out to the darkness, immediately begin to detonate the bomb and head back to the middle. All three people should be doing this at the same time. Note that when all the bombs detonate and the screen flashes, all the thrall will die. So Try to make your elemental well before the bombs detonate. When everyone is ready, the bombs will go off and Oryx will be stunned for damage. The first damage phase will be a bit shorter because you only detonated three bombs. So don't worry too much about how much of his health bar you chunk away. When the damage is over, you either do bombs or shade. Finish those challenges as normal and get ready to repeat everything for the second phase. The only difference for the later phases is one corner should have two bombs left since one was left over from the previous phase. Make note of this corner after each phase and try to detonate it for a four bomb phase on phases two, three, and four. Ideally, going into phase four, you should be able to finish his health off without using heavy to conserve it for the final stand. For final stand, you will stun him two separate times with the bomb. If your ammo economy is good, it should be a pretty free kill. Though I should note you probably won't have Font of Might here. If you do run out of ammo, Touch of Malice is a great option and Outbreak if you don't have it. Here is a full phase to show how we communicate in the pacing of the encounter. Whatever. Top left is the double. Okay.
have a new strategy for blasting all the night, so I don't think I need help at all. Okay. Hopping on. Oh. I'm torn. I can kill the last night. Oh, you good. got it. Are you good? It's uh, top right. Do you get all the knights? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to die. Please give me restoration. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> Laurely moment. I love Laurely, man. It's just so OP. <laughs> it's literally classy early. restoration. Okay. Born. Top right. Uh, opposite. Off. Horn. Top right, Jeff again. Base? Oh. Uh, opposite again. I'll do... It was top left we needed to do twice of, right? Pretty sure. Yeah, yeah Jeff, you do that. Eli, you do bottom it, left. Yeah. I'll go diagonally here. Got it. I'm gonna go slam now. Yeah, we have time. Try and let some ads live in middle. Yep. Go. Go. Nice. Got one at least. I don't have my well yet. I'll have it soon. We have Radiant for now though. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm also proccing Radiant with my melee, so... I hate how these Thrall just flinch you. It's so weird, the way they flinch you. Alright, good. That's really good do, damage. Do. Well, that's it for the guide. If you found it helpful, make sure to like the video and subscribe for future low man guides, as well as challenge videos, day one clears, and other fun Destiny stuff. A special thanks to everyone in the video for strat crafting with me and helping me put it all together. But that's all from me for now. Have a good one.